Uh, w. Rambo, let me ask you to begin. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, at Catholic Charities, when we think about our work, we think about justice, we think about compassion, we think about dignity for all. We believe in solidarity, our interrelatedness, and the importance and value we each have. We believe that we are our sister's keeper, our brother's keeper. We're a mission-driven organization, we're purpose-driven, uh, we're committed to our anti-poverty work because we know that the playing field out there is just not level, that far too many of those living in our communities have challenges that they cannot overcome simply on their own, and we do our best to try and mitigate disadvantages for those that experience them. And we know we can't do this alone, um, so we look to like-minded people to help support our work. As a social justice agency of the church here in Boston, we do this not because you are Catholic, but because we are Catholic. And we encourage and welcome all to join us. We can stop there. Because there's going to be more, I know. Sure. <laughs> wow, it's going to be hard for me to meet the, uh, that time uh, limit. <laughs> I, <laughs> you said a few minutes. You said a standard. Rand's position um, on charity can't be understood without understanding her position more broadly on morality. Rand undoes 2,000 plus years of moral thinking. She challenges the Judeo-Christian tradition. She rejects it. Her argument is that one's life is not owned by one's brother. You are not your brother's keeper, you're not your brother's servant, your moral responsibility is not towards your fellow man. She rejects that in favor of a notion that your moral responsibility is to you, to your own life, to your own happiness, to your own success, to your own flourishing. That it's your, that the standard for all the decisions you make all the moral decisions that you make is what impact is that going to have on my ability to live my life to my fullest fullest capacity of joy and happiness so her position on charity is not you should never do it well you should do it it's well it depends charity has to fit in to this question of is this consistent with my values, with the requirements of my life, the requirements of my happiness? Is this going to lead me to have a better, more fulfilling, more complete life? If it is, then charity is fine. She says she has nothing against charity. But it can be a duty. It can be your primary moral responsibility because then it's not about your life. It's about somebody else's life. And she, again, rejects that notion. I know it's hard for anybody who's not read Ayn Rand to even conceive of this because we are so steeped in the idea that morality is about the other. Everything about morality is the other. And she's starting from scratch, and she's saying, you know, she's asking the question of why. And if morality is a set of values, what do values mean if not in the context of your own life, in the requirements for living? Um, and we can get into what are those values and, and you know, the, the emphasis here is that this is not a, some kind of subjectivist morality and you do whatever you please. This is about your long-term rational uh, well-being and your long-term rational happiness long-term. So, and pursuing those kind of values. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into the, the details of what all that means. So I try to keep it short too. Debbie, you began with such a short comment. I'm sure... <laughs> Your own has said something that must be getting your hackles up or your or or, or the back of your neck bristling. <laughs> well, what's, what's wrong with with the argument that he makes, or or the argument that uh, uh, that Ayn Rand makes? Well, I think what's um, interesting when you think about uh, people and their relationships is that really no one is an individual. Um, you know, if, if you're going to describe an individual, when does that individual start? Is it as an adult person? Is it as uh, a part of a family? Is it part of a community? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually think that uh, when you say um, everyone can make their own choice and there's freedom and certainly freedom to make your own choice and choose what you want to do, um, that theory would suggest that I have the freedom to be charitable. 
um, if that's what I choose to do. And I think, um, you know, that co combine that with the call that uh, the Ju Judeo-Christian traditions have to um, to be charitable, to to look out for one another, to keep each other's best interest in mind. Um, you know, it, it's not a, they are not mutually exclusive. So there's no such thing as family. There's no such thing as society. There's no such thing as anything other than individuals. That's all there is. And we can abstract this individual has a relationship with that individual and a relationship with that individual, and we can call that family. But all we actually exists out there, the only decisions that are made, the only conscious faculty is held within an individual. The, everything else is an abstraction that, we, that is convenient and is important that we use and, and we, can, we can use it effectively, but that's not what exists out there. An individual, you can see it. As an individual, you can't see a family. A family is an abstract concept that unites individuals. Yes, as I said, you can choose to be charitable, but Rand would say it is an immoral choice. It is indeed a vice to choose to be charitable if it's at your expense. So in this sense, and this is again, this is where she's radical. Self-sacrifice, and, and let's define what self-sacrifice is, so at least you know what I mean by self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice means giving something and expecting what in return? Nothing, or something of lesser value. So it's by definition a lose-win proposition, and I'm not just talking about material things. I'm talking about in the total package of your values, material and spiritual. It's giving up something and getting something less in return. Because if you give up something and you get something more in return, what do we call that? A trade. It's not a sacrifice. She would say self, she said self-sacrifice is the essence in morality of evil, of wrong. Because if morality is about life, if morality is about making your life better, then lose situations. Situations where you're losing are not good for you. They're the anti-morality. They're the opposite of what is moral. So charity is fine if, it's in a, if you can conceive of it as a trade, if you can conceive of it as my life in some way. I value human life and the cost is minimal to me. Or this person who I'm giving the charity to is a really good person that is going to contribute in some way to my life in some way. Maybe even I don't know exactly how, but I know they're smart and they're virtuous. Uh, but charity is not a duty and it's a vice if its consequences are a loss to you. What happens to a society, I'll put this to both of you, what happens to a society, or what would happen to a society in which that became the central organizing principle, in which the only time people were expected to behave in a charitable way, to make a charitable contribution, was when they, or, or I, I presume this includes to, to donate time, to, to, sure. and all that, to be charitable in the broad sense, when the only time that they were expected to do it, when the only time they were taught to do it, was when they felt that they would get something in return. What, what, what kind of a society would that lead to? And why, and why is that a society that we would all find ourselves more comfortable living in or better off being in, uh, if we would, as I presume you would say, um, uh, and, 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 and why not, if, as I assume W would say, we wouldn't? I think it would be a wonderful society. It would be the most benevolent society that one could imagine, and it would be an incredibly productive and positive society. But let, but let me, let me, I mean, the, the way to think about this is not to think about, a, you know, a society in which nobody wanted to be charitable. What are they doing? What are they pursuing? What is the positive? It would be a society in which people pursued their own productive ability, in which people went out and created stuff and built stuff and felt pride from doing so. I, I'd like to comment on Bill Gates maybe in this context. You know. It would be a society of, of Bill Gates's producing wealth and producing profit and trading, and a, a society in which every relationship we had, we felt like we were growing and we were getting better as a consequence, where there was no envy and resentment for the wealth of somebody else, because you knew that the reason they got wealthy is by making, among other things, by making me better off. I, I'm better off for Microsoft. I'm better off for Bill Gates getting, becoming a billionaire. So it's a society in which people have the, the, the personal responsibility, and I don't mean it in a superficial, conservative way, but the deep-held personal responsibility that their life matters and that they need to take care of themselves and that they need to work hard to make their life the best that it can be, which leads to self-esteem and happiness 
it, so to me, this is a society of builders and creators and makers. So the need to, for charity is minimal. Poverty is a non is 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 a is a is exists, but it's it's a trivial issue. Indeed, capitalism, free markets, it, you know, raise the poor up dramatically. So you, you need a lot more charity today in Africa than you do in the United States. There's a reason for that. You need more charity in the United States today than you needed in the United States a hundred years ago, in my view, when the country was freer. So when you have freedom, you get you you need less, and then people are going to be charitable, but they're going to be charitable for what I consider the right reason. They're going to be charitable because, in general, w rational, self-interested people value human life. They value their own life. They value other people's lives because other people produce stuff. They create stuff. You know, their success is my success. This is not a, 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 a doggy dog world. This is a, a trading world, a world in which your success benefits me. Jump so, in. Is he well, convincing you? No. <laughs> I'm afraid because I'm a little stuck back at just the individual. Um, you know, none of us just pop out ready to go. Um, so the, the, the sense that there's not relationship that matters and there's um, that everyone has the capacity to be as um, successful as you suggest without good solid relationships surrounding them, guiding them, um, coaching them. You know, when we, when we even look at um, folks at, at the research today about success and young children and kids who, what makes the difference between a kid who lives in poverty um, able to succeed and a kid who lives in poverty able not to succeed? And the research points us, all the resiliency research points us to connection important connection. And so to suggest that connection doesn't matter, um, I mean, I'm stuck way back there. Let me, so, let, so let me sharpen the question for a second. You are, um, uh, you're, in, you're in India, you're Mother Teresa. You're walking down the street. Was she in India or was she in Albania? Yeah. She was Albanian, but she, in she lived in, Albanian, in India. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're walking down the street and you see um, uh, people who are desperately ill, lying in the gutter, uh, hours or days away from death. Uh, there's no chance that there's anything productive that's gonna be added that, to the world uh, if you give them money, if you take them in. If, uh, the, the only reason to help people who are, who are in, in extremists like that uh, is because you wanna do something good for them. Um, you said that the reason, Yaron, you said that the, that the reason people would give charity is because uh, it's good for all of us to have a society in which we help each other since people are cr creative, people are productive, people will, will make new wealth, people will go on to do uh, great things. What happens, about, what happens when the case is clear that these are, we're talking about people who need help and there's very little likelihood that any of them are ever going to do anything that w would create new wealth or be creative? Well, if, if the world was dominated by people like me, then nothing would happen then they would live in the same condition they've always lived in. That is, the fact that they are poor, the fact that they are needy, the fact that they are desperate is not a claim against my life. It's not a reason for me to live less well. It's, you know, it's the reality that they're in that situation. Now, you know, if I lived in Calcutta, right, if I lived in India and I had a business there and I had an interest in that world, then there are certain people that I would help, but not indiscriminately, not to anybody. And, and the fact is th that nobody does. I mean, this is, this is the whole notion. Nobody does that. There are, uh, you know, we, we supposedly live in a very uh, altruistic, uh, charitable, charity is the most important thing in the world. Luckily, that just isn't true. Because the fact is that there are millions of people like that today. Indeed, there are tens of millions of people like that today in Africa and in India, and nobody does anything. And, and that's, but, but we have to remember that that's the state in which humanity exists without individualism, without freedom, without productiveness, without people going out there and working and creating stuff. That is, unfortunately, the state in which we live unless we have freedom and unless we use our minds to rise up. But the fact that they haven't risen up is not my fault. I don't feel guilty about it, and it's not my responsibility. It's not a claim against me. Where does that claim come from? The well, I, I don't think that charity comes from a guilt-placed position. Um, I don't think the, it, that guilt is in the equation. Um, I don't uh, do the work that I do because I feel guilty that there are people out there who 
don't have maybe what I have. I do the work that I do because I have resources that I can bring to bear to help people uh, do better. People who want to do better, do better. Um, and so I don't think guilt fits into the equation really at all. Um, you know, I kind of go back to this connectedness, and, and, and you're talking about India. It's going to be India and China and Indonesia. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in those countries as they're emerging markets and they're growing and businesses are growing. Um, it's just going to be interesting to see what happens in the real abject poverty that's there um, and what changes might happen. Um, let, let me just say uh, two issues you brought up. One is this about helping people. I love helping people. I mean, I'm a teacher. We're glad right? to hear that. It's, but it's not a sacrifice. I'm conveying to them knowledge where they get valuable. I'm gaining from the fact I enjoy conveying the knowledge. I enjoy the fact that by bringing them that knowledge, I hope they become more productive, they become better people, that rebounds back on me. So again, this isn't about not wanting to help. It's about pursuing your own values. It's about making your values the primary and being guided by that. And I'm glad that, that you're not motivated by guilt. And I, I don't think charity should ever be motivated by guilt. Again, I don't think it's moral if it's motivated by unearned guilt. If you've got unearned guilt, deal with it. You know, get rid of the guilt. Don't appease it. Appeasing the guilt is not, is not the solution. So it's not about, you know, I, I believe, and you know, so we'll bring up Bill Gates again. I believe Bill Gates helped more people in Microsoft than he or any philanthropist or all the philanthropists put together in the world will ever help. The fact is that he has touched every life on every continent in the entire world. I'm not sure we would have an internet today without Bill Gates. Uh, he's created an amount of wealth that is hard to describe because you can't just deal with the wealth he's created for himself, but all the wealth he's created for other employees, shareholders, and so on. He's raised the standard of living of people everywhere in the world. Now, why do we put him in a different category? We put him in a different category because he benefited. We can see he benefited while he was helping people, right? But so what? I mean, isn't that a good thing that he benefited while he was helping people? Why is that different? Now he's doing charity. He's doing charity, so we say now he's a good guy. So creating wealth, helping people, because that's how you create wealth. You create wealth by providing people a value where they are better off as a consequence. So creating wealth by helping people, that morally is, uh, is just is suspect generally, right? That's, that we don't accept in our culture. But giving it away after you've created, that's okay, even though you know, it's, it, it's incomparable the amount of good you're doing uh, between the two. But again, if, if helping people is the standard, shouldn't we praise him for both? And, and, but we don't, because we want sacrifice. What we want is to see him suffer. I mean, I like to say Bill Gates really becomes a moral icon if he gave it all away and moved into a tent. And if he should sow some blood in the process where he really hurt, that would be an advantage. That would make him a really virtuous I'm, person because I, I, then you could take out I'm any struck, element of self-interest. I'm struck by, by the, the tone uh, seems almost <laughs> angry in the way that you yeah. I'm angry you at the culture, that. I am. I'm angry that we don't appreciate Bill Gates for the wealth that he created because I think it is an enormous, talk about justice, I think it is an enormous injustice. I'm not angry at him for giving away his money, I'm angry at the way he does it, but I'm not angry at him at giving away his money, I'm angry at the culture for not appreciating his genius and not appreciating the wealth he created and the benefit we all got from Debbie, let me ask you this. Well, can Sir, oh, go can ahead. I ask a question? I don't understand um, who you think doesn't appreciate <laughs> Bill Gates. I mean, I have a computer. I'm thrilled to have a computer. Um, I, th you know, I think that the product that he's brought to market and it has been wonderful, and I think um, you know, when we look to business, we hope that business is working for the greater good, whether they make, and hope that people make money. Um, everybody should be successful if they can be. Just look, just go back to the 90s and read the newspaper articles on Bill Gates. Watch the movies that portray people like Bill Gates. We live in a culture that, yes, we, 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 we want to be like Bill Gates, but from an ethical, moral perspective, we resent him and we're angry at him and we go after him. And we write laws, we write a lot of laws, and we encourage government to go out there and control him and take as much of his wealth away from him and, and break his company up if we can. We as a culture are filled with envy and resentment towards him, and I find that incredibly unjust. And I think it comes from this notion that creating wealth is, 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 is not moral, but that giving it away is. 
Isn't there a convergence between the two positions? Uh, ideally, wouldn't there be a convergence between the two positions you express? Uh, Debbie, obviously it's the case that before wealth can be given away, it has to be created. Certainly. So shouldn't advocates of charity, shouldn't Catholic charity, shouldn't the Archdiocese of Boston, uh, shouldn't any, uh, any, anyone who teaches or, or promotes or wants to create a culture of charity uh, just as much, just as strongly want to create a culture of freedom that will make possible the, 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 the building of wealth? Shouldn't the Catholic Church, for example, uh, be a, a strong advocate of capitalism as unbridled as, as is politically possible? Uh, shouldn't it be constantly urging that uh, that the shackles that hold wealth creators back be eased so that there can be more wealth creation? I, I, I'm not a theologian. I'm a social worker, so I'll, but, I'll, but I'll take a stab at this. Um, I do think that um, we certainly, we benefit from uh, the wealth that people have created for themselves. They, do, they are donors to our work, as well as donors to charitable work everywhere. Um, and I think that that's wonderful and remarkable. I think that sometimes the regulation that you talk about and the government, uh, which you might consider interference in businesses' abilities to grow, happen, um, uh, and I'm not a politician either, but happen um, when there's a sense that there's been a lack of trust in the process of how someone grew their wealth. And so if you're growing your wealth in a way that disadvantages other people, in the process of growing it, um, if you're not telling the truth, if you are not honest in your dealings, um, if you uh, don't pay people uh, a fair salary for the work that they've done, um, then um, I think that's when people get angry with people who make a lot of money. I understand that you're not a theologian, right. and, I, and I don't mean to, you know, to make you yeah. the spokesman for the Catholic Church. Um, Thank you. But, <laughs> but I still find myself wondering, since there has to be wealth before there can be charity, shouldn't we be surprised that you don't hear the preachers in the pulpit, or for that matter, you know, the rabbis in the synagogue, or or or, or the imams in the uh, you know in uh, in the mosques, speaking much more vigorously and much more frequently and much more enthusiastically about the importance of creating wealth and the and, and the importance of the freedom that's required for for wealth creators to be able to go out and do it. Instead, there's much more of what of what you just alluded to. Uh, the, the restrictions, the need to control, the need to have regulation, the need to keep people from doing wrong things. But let's, let's stipulate that both are necessary. Uh, I don't know if, if your own would stipulate that, but let's mm. stipulate for the moment that both of them are necessary. I wonder why we don't hear equal enthusiasm from religious leaders who want to see more charity for more wealth creation, the freedom that makes that possible. Um, if, if I could just take a step back, I think that um not all charity is dollars. Uh, there's a charity of relationship. There's charity, you know, as your own suggestive education. There's lots of different kinds of charity, and it's not just all dollar driven. So I think, um, from a from a the perspective of relationship, um, it's really not all about money. Your own, would you feel differently if uh, you wandered into a church or into a? Uh, in, into a synagogue and, and heard well, you, you, a you throated you, argument in favor of freedom? You, you find certain evangelical churches uh, claiming that Christianity is all about making as much money as you can as an individual and, and so on. So there are churches in which this is the attempt has been done. But no, I, I, I don't find that uh, reassuring. But of course, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's consistent, right? I don't think that religion can go there. Uh, I think some marginal churches can do it, but I don't think most religions can do it because, again, this goes back to the central ethical point. Capitalism, freedom, creating wealth require a certain ethic, and that is an ethic focused on individual achievement, individual success. It requires an ethic of self-interest. And the ethic, as I understand it, I'm not a theologian either, of religion, the Judeo-Christian tradition, is an ethic of self-sacrifice of denial of self. I mean, I grew up in a good Jewish household. We were told, my mother taught me, to be selfless, to think of yourself last. Now, I don't think she actually meant that, but that's what we are taught. That is the ethical standard. So you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't advocate for an ethic of selflessness and then tell people, go be selfish in order to create wealth. And this is indeed the problem with people like Adam Smith and the problem with many advocates of capitalism. 
who come from, I think, the, Christ, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition, they try to have their cake and eat it too, and nobody believes them. Nobody believes th that, that it's okay to be self-interested because that way you create a lot of wealth so that you can give it away afterwards. So, you know, that, so a, lot of a lot of vice added together is virtue. Rand rejects the idea that the standard is other people's well-being. She's, it's about the virtue of self-interest. And capitalism is about, whether we like it or not, capitalism is about self-interest. And I think that people who reject the idea of morality of self-interest cannot be true advocates of capitalism. You said earlier that you think America would, uh, would require less charity uh, today and that you believe there, that less was required back when it was a, a freer society if there were more uh, freedom today. Um, I wonder if, from the perspective of freedom, if it's not a little bit dangerous to be deriding the charitable impulse. Um, you remember from your, uh, uh, you know, your Tocqueville, talking about democracy in America, you know, traveling in America, I think it was in the 18, early 1820s or the late 18 teens, and describing how for virtually every, uh, every action, every good thing, every, uh, every, every goal that was perceived, there were private institutions that were coming together, there were for this, this charitable form of, of, of uh, volunteerism, donors, uh, isn't, isn't, that kind, isn't that impulse, that impulse to help others, to do for others, to come together, to, to sacrifice for a, for, a, for a larger cause, for societal cause, whatever that cause might be, whether it's you know, uh, Catholic Charities or whether it's uh, uh, you know, the Ayn Rand Institute, which I assume is a 501c3 yes. organization. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> As I said, it, 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 I'm it, not against charity. Together? I'm not against charity. I'm against an impulse for charity. I don't know what that means because I don't think we have that kind of impulse. Um, I'm for charity when it's rational, when it's in pursuit of your values. And I believe that a free people are the most charitable people in the world. Under freedom, people are more charitable. A, they have more wealth. B, they're more benevolent because their life is good because they are free. And C, they, have a, they value other people. So yes, in uh, 19th century America, people helped their neighbors out because they knew that their neighbors were pretty good people and if they helped them out, they would do something good and it would be bound on them that at the end of the day, they were building a world that was better for them through their, their charity. But the charity was not the center of their life. The center of their life was, as it should be, their productive work, their achievement, what they were doing. Charity, as Ayn Rand said, she said in the quote you gave, she's not against charity. She just says it's not a major virtue. It's a minor issue. It's an issue that once I'm taking care of myself, of my family, of the things that are most important to me, and there's, there's, a, there's a neighbor across the street who needs my help, sure, why wouldn't I go and help him put up, you know, put up the roof, or, or if his house burned down, go help and build another house, if he's a good guy. You know, if he's a bad guy, I'm not going to do it. It's based on my values and my choices. And again, I, I think the example of America is such a, Free people are incredibly benevolent, and benevolent people help each other out when it's in their self-interest. Should, should young people be taught to be benevolent? I don't think if, you you're raising, if you're raising kids and one of them is just a naturally gregarious, uh, loving child who always wants to share his candy and his toys with others, and the other is a grumpy, surly... Hoarder. Adolescent in training. <laughs> Does this sound like it uh, cuts they all close to home they, for they're me? They're all te teenagers in the end, right? Um, Should young people be taught that there is a... No. So I, 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 I find it horrific, the idea of, of, uh, of kids being taught to share. Um, I know. It's, uh, so, so Johnny's playing in the sandbox, and, and, uh, and a stranger, Mike, comes over and says, I want to play with your tractor. And the parent jumps up and says, do it, do it. You've got to do it. And, and why? Why should he do it? I mean, I'm all for teaching Johnny to trade. I'll give you my tractor if you give me your backhoe or whatever. Um, but no deep, no deep hypocrisy, because this is incredibly hypocritical. And the child knows it. And we, we live in, 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 in an unbelievably hypocritical society. The child knows that if a stranger came up to mommy and asked for the car keys, mommy wouldn't give it to them. <laughs> but he's expected to. But there's a reason that exists. But mommy it, might give them a ride. Might or might not, depending on who the stranger was and how he looked and it, you know, how he approached. Again, it depends. Or help him um, find the bus or maybe. some other alternative route. Yes. But why, no, why, should it why should it depend? You're, you've, got, you've got a car, you're driving down Com Ave, it's pouring rain outside. 
There's a, you know, there's, a, there's a person there who didn't take a raincoat and you know, doesn't have an umbrella, got caught unexpectedly in the rain. You're going down the, the street anyway, and even if uh, wherever that person needs to go, it's a little bit out of your way. You've got a car and she doesn't. Uh, how, how, are you, how are you diminished? How is the community diminished by not stopping and saying, can I give you a lift? You're going to get soaked if you stand there. So I'll stop by saying I don't, know what, I don't understand what it means by the community being diminished. But... How am I diminished? Well, it, it depends, right? It, it, it depends on, you know, what this person is like. Do they look dangerous? Are they not dangerous? Are they a friendly? Are they not friendly? Am I in a hurry? Am I not in a hurry? All of these are factors. I'm not saying right now I wouldn't give them a ride, but I'm not saying what I'm rejecting is the idea no, that I have why, a moral why you, obligation. Why might you give that person a ride? Well, again, because... Assume not dangerous and assume, you know, all, because, all the other things being equal. Because, again, human life is a value to me. And if it doesn't cost me a lot, I'm always, you know, I hold the door to some stranger, right? To, uh, you know, and I'd give somebody a ride under certain circumstances. Human life is a value. Other people create stuff that provides me with good stuff. I don't mind sharing, right, in those contexts with them. But it has to be a context that does not diminish my life. If it diminishes from me, if it's a sacrifice, I won't do it. Debbie, let me ask you one last question, then we'll, then we'll turn to the audience. Okay, but I, I was gonna ask yeah. you to define sacrifice. As I said, it's, it's doing an act where you lose. That is, you give something up and get something, or expect to get nothing, or something less in return. And I'm, I'm lose, not just lose material a, stuff. So I, for example, don't consider, so I have two boys, and I, did not, I didn't teach them to share, and they turned out okay. Um, they might have learned someplace else. <laughs> and, I, uh, you know, and I didn't sacrifice for them, because you know what? I really love my children, and they're an incredibly high value. So when I didn't go to the movies and stayed at home with my kids, it's because they're more important to me than the movies. So that's a, a whole, you know, that's, that to me is not a sacrifice. Sacrifice is losing is being worse off as a consequence, expecting to be worse off as a consequence, because sometimes you make mistakes and you are worse off as a consequence. But the anticipation, I'm doing this knowing that I'll be worse off as a consequence, and that's what makes it a value. That's what I think sacrifice means. Last question for me. Let me put this out and, and, and then I'll, uh, we'll, we'll turn to the audience. Those of you with questions ready, please uh, by all means line up behind the microphone. There's a lot of research that shows that Happy, levels of personal happiness correlate with levels of charitable giving. Why is that? If, as you say, your own uh, charity means losing something, charity means diminishing yourself, I would think that more charity would mean uh, less happiness. So first, I didn't say that. So let's be clear on what I said. I didn't say charity is necessarily a sacrifice. I think it can be a sacrifice. But being charitable can be a positive thing, can be a, a, a value-added thing. So I'm, again... I'm not against charity. I'm just against charity as a duty, and I'm against charity where you are sacrificing. Now, why are people happier? You know, I, I guess I'm suspicious of happiness studies. I've read a lot of them. I've looked at the data. They're very subjective. There's no definition of happy. Nobody, nobody defines the term. I think the reason is that people are taught that this is what they have to do in order to be a good person that this is a requirement of being virtuous, so that they, they can only think of themselves as being good, happy in some sense, if they be charitable. So I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But again, I'm, I'm suspicious generally of happiness studies. Even if you showed me the reverse, I'd be suspicious of it. Uh, and there are studies that show other stuff that supports my claim. I'm still suspicious of them because of the way they're conducted and what they do. I, again, but the point is, I think most Americans in a big chunk of their life, not in all of their life, are generally self-interested, generally try to pursue their own self-interest. Uh, and in some of their charity, even that is true in some of their charity, not in all of it. In some of it is, is driven from guilt, and some of it is driven by a sense of moral duty, and I'm generally against moral duty to others. Debbie, do you want to take a crack at that before we turn to our audience? Well, I guess I'm struck by this notion of sacrifice as always being a, a loser that uh, in all sacrifice you've lost. Um, and, and I just don't, 
I just don't think that that well, what premise. What would be the definition of sacrifice? Well, I was going to ask you that. Well, I just if that's my definition. Well, how would you define? Well, it? I think sacrifice. Um, you know, if you say uh, choosing not to go to the movies so you can stay home with your children, that's a choice, not necessarily a sacrifice no, that makes a you sacrifice. a loser, right? Yeah. So what is a sacrifice? Um, a sacrifice might be doing without something so that somebody else can have it, but it's very similar to choosing to stay home with your children so, and not go out. So to me, it would be a sac choosing not to have something in order to for somebody else, w whether it's a sacrifice or not, mm -hmm. would depend on why you did it and who that person is. So if I choose um, not to, if I choose to give my money to, you know, make this extreme to a to a uh, a murderer and therefore put my life at risk, that is a sacrifice, right? If I choose to give my money to a good friend of mine who's having a hard time right now and, you know, who I, who I love and respect and I think is a good person, that's not a sacrifice because they're more important to me than the money I gave them. So it's not the action. It's, it's why you're doing it and it's, you know, what, what you expect the consequences to be. Let's turn to our illustrious audience. Go right ahead. Can we get the, anybody yep. get the house lights up a little bit? It's can't see faces from where we're standing. Deborah, you're involved in the Catholic Church and its doings, uh, which is an organization which seems to have a tendency towards big government. Do you agree that we should have a larger and larger government which hands out so-called charity programs, social programs, or are you in favor of cutting back on those, which would be not characteristic of the usual Catholic? See. How about, how about letting us keep more of our money, Deborah, so that we can give more to charity? Isn't that a moral act? More moral than government at gunpoint extracting our money in the name of charity? Well, I think that whether government is big or small, um, government needs to be smart. And um, I certainly am in favor of as smart a government as we can have. And I also believe that um, the way our life is today, that charity can't take care of all the problems that exist in our world. Um, government can't take care of all the problems that exist in the world, and there needs to be some combination of effort between the two. Um, so I, I would, you know, I would reject the notion that either side could do everything. Sir. Okay. Yes, uh, you're wrong. Uh, you did make a statement I agree with 100%, and that is the value of, of a person like Bill Gates, that he, uh, you know, by creating the, compu the personal computer, he has done a tremendous amount of good for the world. I would tell you that his worth is more than a thousand uh, Mother Teresa's. However, let's look at the other side of the coin. In his achieving what he did, he destroyed a lot of, uh, a lot of companies, a lot of people who were creative, and he just, you know, his Microsoft just bullied everybody. And you've got, uh, but the, I think the big, the big thing that, 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 that concerns me was the particularly financial uh, situation that we have today, where banks loaned money to, uh, to people who never should have been loaned, had the money loaned to them, and of course the, the financial institutions packaged them together and sold them off as, uh, as AAA uh, securities when they, were, when they were total garbage. And this is a person who is, you know, these, these are people who are, uh, you know, supposedly, uh, you know, self-interested, self-divulgent, self and this is supposed to be for the good of developing wealth. I mean, every one of us in this room has had help from somebody. I mean, we just didn't, weren't born and then left, left to our own devices. And growing up, we've had plenty of help from, from everybody. So I would like to know what, I, I, I would like your comment on uh, this aspect of the downside of your of, of your particular philosophy and how it's how it is to be corrected and how this is going to uh, work so two years ago I did a debate here at the Fort Hall forum on the financial crisis it's up on their website I encourage you to see it and you'll get my full position on the financial crisis which is a crisis caused from beginning to end at every step and at every level by government by government regulations by government control and by government incentives that created the kind of behavior that, that you, that, that kind of behavior would have never existed in a true free market. But, but let, me get to, let, me get, let me get to Bill Gates and let me get to uh, a question you asked which is related to something that was mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah, I mean, in competition, some companies go out of business and some companies succeed. That is the marketplace. That is not 
Bill Gates didn't use force on anybody. He didn't destroy anybody. He built something. Other people couldn't compete. He succeeded. They lost. That's the nature. They benefited at the end of the day from the fact that he succeeded. They're better off. They went to, they went to work for Google or they went to work for Amazon or they went to work for some technology that without Bill Gates would have never been invented. Um, but, I, but, but your point is, and this is the interconnected point, right? Somebody helped you. We're all interconnected. Yeah, of course we're all interconnected in, in, in a sense, right? And I, I admitted that, and I stated the principle by which I believe we should be interconnected. And that's the principle of trade. Yeah, I help my kids. I, I'm getting something back. <laughs> it's not a sacrifice. And I hope to get more out of it back. I, I mean, I might be wrong. My kids could out, turn out awful, and I could regret helping them, which would be very, very sad and very, very tragic. But that's not my intention, right? So... I'm trading with people. Bill Gates, yeah, he couldn't have built it without his employees. Wait, who are you trading with? My and kid. My you, kid. You say that you hope that your child will turn out well. Yes, no. I but mean, how is your child giving... I, I consider investment back. a trade. So I'm investing in the future, right? So, uh, you know, you get, you get the trade right then and there by the fact that they're cute and funny and friendly and so on. But some of it is clearly an investment in the future and the fact that you know, that they will grow up to be people you admire and respect and, and have a loving relationship with. It doesn't always turn out that way. I mean, and that's, that's sad uh, that it doesn't, but that's the intention. So sometimes investments go badly, but, but the point is that you're investing in a person, you're investing in people, and, and again, Bill Gates needed his employees. Sure he did. He paid them. So again, it was a trade. Uh, the way in which we're interconnected is through these trade relationships. I give, I get. And I think, I think, yeah, I don't want to live in a desert island. Life would be horrible in a desert island in the middle of the woods. I want to live in a civilization, but not in a civilization where we each feel like we're, we're morally obligated to somebody else, that my life is not mine. I am, from the moment I'm born, my moral duty is to help you, is to serve you, is to fulfill your need. There's somebody in India who's uh, starving right now. I need to send a check. There's always going to be somebody who needs something from me. I don't want to live in a world like that. I want to live in a world where I can pursue my dreams. You pursue your dreams. We choose to interact through a trade relationship. You get into trouble. You come to me. You ask for help. You don't force me to help. You don't guilt me into helping. If I can and you're a good person, I will help you, but I might not be able to help you. Debbie, thoughts? Well, well I, actually, you know, you said that the financial was because of the government. It was because of lack of government regulation. Yes. No, too but, much government regulation. But again, I refer okay, you yeah, to that. I don't want to We're not going to do the financial discussion crisis. here. Focuses on charity and, yeah. and donation. To I, I do think it's interesting to hear you talk about um, relation, human relationship in terms of business terms, the trade, return on investment. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's just a different language and a different way to look at the world. Um, and and also I think this um, the, this the thing that you talk about that that's the expectation that you Yaron have to send all your money to India to help the poor people in India is just not um, accurate I don't think to say how people feel about our responsibility for others. Let's have another question, sir. Um, well, this actually nicely leads into my question. So. Uh, Mother Teresa was mentioned earlier in the debate, and of course she's a major Catholic figure, so I'd uh, expect you to um, uh, admire her, but I think most people do admire her, and she's a kind of symbol of uh, this idea that we should, should be charitable. So I, I want to ask about what I think is one of her most famous statements, and really kind of, I think, captures what she was all about, which is the idea that you should give until it hurts. And the way I interpret that isn't as soon as it hurts, you should stop giving, don't, which sounds more like what something you're on might think, but rather that you're not giving enough unless it's hurting, that important to what's good about giving is that we suffer as Jesus did for, for others. And is that something that you think is admirable? Is that something that's part of what it is to have a more responsibility to be charitable uh, or not? And uh, you're on also your comments on that, I'd like to hear. I think that... Um you know, far be it for me to argue with Mother Teresa. Um, oh, go ahead. We won't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be on the internet. <laughs> It'll be everywhere. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, 
so a, a fine theologian did say to me once, um, if, the, if the left and the right can't find common ground, um, you know, they, it's not a good space to be in. There is common ground. We have to learn how to work together. So this notion of giving till it hurts, I think, you know, translated to me is, um, you know, give, give in a way that matters. Um, give in a way that's smart, that makes a difference, that makes sense. Um, not give that you're in, in abject pain, but give in a way that makes sense that's going to make a difference. I mean, I think Mother Teresa was serious, and I think, I think she identifies a, a key to what makes, in the minds of many people, to what makes charity virtuous, and that is that it involves pain, that it involves suffering. Uh, you know, if you look at who becomes a saint, it's often those who suffer the most. They are the most revered. They are the most virtuous. They are the most moral because we measure morality in the culture. We measure it based on how much you've given of yourself. And the ultimate that you can give of yourself is your life to others. And again, this is exactly what I'm rejecting. I'm rejecting the notion that morality is measured by your suffering and somebody else's gain. Morality should be measured by how good your life is and how much you do for yourself. And to the extent that that involves helping others, great, but only to that extent. Well, I, let me take a stab at the sainthood um, because I do believe that m most of the saints in our church um, are saints um, because they were persecuted for what they believed and their suffering ca came from having a set of beliefs, not from... Um, the charity that's painful in the way that you describe. But even the notion of, of Jesus as sacrifice is it's not that he was persecuted for what he believes. That's not what makes Jesus Jesus. It's the fact that he suffered. He died the most horrible death you can imagine. Have you ever read the details of what a crucifixion is like? You can't imagine dying in a more painful way. But that is. But he died for us in that painful way. It's the fact that it's 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 the sacrifice to us that elevates it. Now it's true. A lot of the saints did sacrifice for an idea, and you could argue whether that idea was worth was worth well, it or not. You could say the same. I certainly Jesus. think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is on sharing and on a comment that um, you made earlier about um, connection and Yaron made about the individual. With sharing, when my kids were quite young, little tykes, they went to a Burger King play yard and some gentleman came up to me and said, how did you do it? How did you get your kids to take turns and to be so kind and generous? And I just looked at him without skipping a beat and I said, I told, taught them they never had to share. And that genuine benevolence came from just not looking at people as a threat. Your swing isn't going to be taken away. And so that gets to the next point, which is the value of connection. I know when earlier on, um, you, said, you interpreted Yaron saying that there are no families as uh, connection doesn't matter. And I think I would like you to hear from Yaron on a concept that Ayn Rand had on psychological visibility and talking about the connection between individuals and do they matter or not. And if you wanted to comment too, that would be great. I mean, I'll just say that my conception of trade is far broader than as a economic activity. I, I, I think love is, is, is something that, you know, when it's, when it's returned in, in a loving relationship, is a trading relationship. You're not trading money. You're not trading goods. You're trading what Rand called, you know, personal visibility, your, your value in somebody else's eyes and, and in, their, in their values and in their spirit. And, and, you know, you can get into psychology, but the point here is that, that there are spiritual trade going on all the time. You get value and enjoyment and pleasure and, and huge satisfaction from other people. You know, as a teacher, I can tell you, I mean, one of the greatest feelings in the world is, is watching the students, you know, a light come on in their eyes. They got something. They understood something. And that's, wow, that's, that's really cool. I, I did something. I get something in return. So... 
it's so it's it's a much broader concept in terms of in terms of human relationships, uh, and I think uh, I think it's one you know the trader principle is is one trade is one that I think captures the essence of how I think healthy human relationships should exist. I I just w would you never teach if in the trade you didn't get a light bulb going off? I I quit teaching. Hmm. I quit teaching. Hi. If I didn't enjoy it. I wouldn't do it. <clears throat> I, I just wonder about this, um, uh, the, the idea that, that you get something back and that, that trade is that much broader. Uh, what if the, would you say that it's, that it is therefore also a form of trade if someone donates, behaves in a charitable way, uh, because the, the benefit that she expects to receive is credit in heaven, is uh, uh, a, a, a more elevated soul? Something spiritual, in other words, something that isn't necessarily visible in the light in a kid's eyes getting multiplication for the first time, or because it's a cute child and you know you feel a, a that, that you know biological connection, but because you believe or you've been taught to believe that there's uh, that, that's meritorious to do so, and that you see as a benefit. Would you regard that as a kind of trade as well? So, so let me first say that that I consider seeing the light come on in somebody's eyes as spiritual. So I, I have. I, well, you, my you conceptual of spiritual is as anything of consciousness that's not material out there. So, uh, you know, I, I don't grant that spiritual is only religious. It, it covers many, many human activities. Um, no, I, I, you know, I think this is a clever way to kind of provide people an incentive to do things that are not in their self-interest in this life because you promised them something in an afterlife. Um, I, you know, I want to deal with reality, n not with stories or, or, or with the, you know, s arbitrary suppositions about an afterlife. Uh, I think you live this life here, you've got this life, it's, <laughs> it's complicated enough to figure out what's good for you in this life. Right, that's you, that's what you think. Yeah. But if somebody comes to Catholic Charities and wants to donate $50, uh, you know, every month. Because it gets them into heaven? Because he thinks that there's... That I there's feel sad for them. Because then, I do, because they're not living the fullest life that they could live right here and now. And I, you know, and it's, it's sad to me that they are sacrificing, giving up life here for mythology. I mean, that's how I would look at it. But how are they mutually exclusive? Well, if they're not mutually exclusive, then fine. Then let's make the measure right here on earth. But the whole argument is that they are. You suffer a little bit here. I mean, this is, you know, we, just look at the book of Job, right? You suffer, you suffer here, not for you to understand even why you suffer, but suffer here. You should, you know, you should give, you should do whatever you're told to do because there's a promise of something else. No, I want to live good here. I want to, I want to be happy right here and now. I want, to, I want this life to be the best, most successful, most flourishing life that I can have here. If, if, I don't believe there is a heaven. I don't, I, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But there is a heaven and I land up there. You know, great. But it's this life that I'm interested in. <laughs> but if trade is in the eye of the beholder, if, if the individual judges what value there is in trade, then those two things can exist together. Yeah, but, but if I see somebody going and buying a car for $20,000 and I know it's a lemon, then I feel bad for them. I'm sad because they're wasting their money. So, uh, so I, I can evaluate somebody else's decision and say, you're making a mistake, in my view. Sir, jump in. Hi, uh, my question relates to the government's role in society in either depressing or promoting charitable giving. Um, my position on charity is a bit extreme in that, you know, as a 29-year-old, I consider Social Security and Medicare to be charity because I don't expect I'll ever see anything out of those programs when it's time for me to retire. So um, my question is, is that since I'm being basically forced to give the charity at the point of a gun, um, <clears throat> I, I feel no obligation whatsoever to give to any other charities. And um, I would argue that I'm not alone in that sentiment. And my question to both of you is, would you, is that, um, I would believe the government enforcing charity like this tends to depress charitable giving in a society. Would you t agree or disagree with that sentiment? I mean, I would agree. I, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, I don't even think about charity today. I mean, because, you know, every paycheck I get, 40%, 40 to 50% is out. And what's left, you know, is by, for me, my family, people I care about. Um, 
I don't think about I wouldn't even conceive of writing a check to a, to a big charitable institution out there. Too much of my money is already taken off the top. If I could keep 100 percent, there are a lot of organizations I could think that I would, you know, be positively inclined to give to because there are a lot of things that I value out there. That I think they help uh, that they would provide help. But I think the bigger issue is not so much that. I think the bigger issue is the fact that if we didn't have government doing what it does, we would just live in so much of a wealthier society that we would, there wouldn't be need for as much charity as we need today. There wouldn't be need for, for as much assistance as is provided today. And if we lived in a culture that respected individuals taking responsibility for their own lives and living their own lives fully, there'd be a lot less demand for charity. People would want less. They, they would view, as they did, I think, 100 years ago, they would view being on the dole, any kind of dole, as a black mark, as something you do temporarily to get back on your feet and to go out there and, and go back to work. I think our culture's changed because of government, not because of charity, but because of government. And, and I would just say that not all charity is money, is cash. Not all charity is right. money. Um, Hold on, I, 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 I have to press both of you on this. I'm not sure that, I, that the, I don't see how your position holds water in your own. You say that because the government takes 40% of your income there and, and spends it on what we might, if it, if it were being given voluntarily, would be considered charitable uh, endeavors, therefore you feel no. Uh, how is that not the same as you're going home, you get mugged, somebody takes, uh, you know, takes the 20 bucks that you had in your wallet, uh, and when you get home, you tell your kid, sorry, you can't eat tomorrow because I already gave to the mugger. It's exactly Why is there a connect? It's you, exactly you, the same. So I feel do like every, every paycheck, I'm being mugged, literally mugged. I don't see a difference. I'm being mugged. 40% of my money is being taken away from me. And now all I've got to spend on me and my family and, and the things that I want to buy is, is the 60% that's left. I have less money, so therefore I'm going to do less with it. Um, there, are certainly, there are certainly things. For example, so if I have $1,000... There's certain things I want to buy with that thousand dollars. If I have two thousand dollars, there's a whole set of other things that I would want to buy. Charity, whether it's cancer research or whether it's a children's hospital or things that I care about, are down the stream of value. So I'm not going to use the first thousand to do that. I'm not going to use the second thousand, and I'm not getting to the third thousand because the government has taken it away once I get to the second. Well, I would completely agree with the with, with the with the premise of the question that the government takes a lot of money from us and spends it on things that most of us would often not want it to be spent on. I, I don't understand how that leads then to the next point, which is therefore I've already done my so, part, and so that e so that even charities that I would want to give to, let's say the Ayn Rand Institute, I'm not going to write a check for because the government already already got charity out of yeah, me. I'm not, I don't feel like giving I, I don't, any more to anybody. I don't think you should write a check to the Ayn Rand Institute if there are values more important to you than the Ayn Rand Institute. So, for example. So I have a hierarchy of values. I have things that are very, very important to me. And let's assume these are all monetary things. These are all things that I spend money on. Things that are very, very important to me, and I spend my first dollars on those. And then things that are next, I spend those. And, and charity might be number 10. It might be number 5. It might be number 100. The children's hospital or whatever. If I have enough money, <laughs> I'll get to it. A saving is a value, right? Saving for my retirement is a value. So it's not that... Uh, I have a pie, right? I have $1,000, and no matter what happens, I'm going to spend 20% on food, 20% on cars. No. You know, there's a hierarchy, and I spend my first dollar here, and I'm not going to get to the dollar of certain causes because I don't have it. So I'm, I'm not sure what's... It, it, the, the, the sense that I got from the, from the questioners, yeah. from the way the questioner framed it, was that he feels... Uh, he feels resentful that the government has taken this money from him, and therefore he doesn't feel that he has any more obligation. See, but I now, don't feel an obligation to begin I, that, with. <laughs> that I understand. That I understand. But in the cases where you yourself would feel that yeah. you have an obligation, such as to take care of your kids, yeah. you wouldn't say, I'm so mad that the mugger got 20 bucks from me, you guys can't have supper tomorrow. No, but I would say, I'm not going to buy the nice car that I've always wanted, that is really, really important to me to have a nice car. Right, that's simply because of I don't have enough money left over for everything that I wanted to do. Yeah, but that's the point. That's what I'm saying is the charity for me is, is, is so if, if you have 100 things that you're going to do, is further down on the list, and because the government's taken that money, I never get to that. That's Debbie, to turn that question around, it's, it, what, the premise 
the, the questioner said he feels he's not the only person who thinks that way, and he's absolutely right. Sure. And there's an enormous amount of data, and I, I actually just wrote about this in a column mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. You go state by state in states where tax rates are higher, where there's a, a more big government mindset that predominates, charitable giving is much, much lower. In states where the attitude, the prevailing political attitude is we shouldn't turn to government for things, Go tax rates should be kept low, government spending should be kept low, charity is much, is much more generously given. It seems to me that just reinforces the earlier point that uh, several of us have brought up, that Catholic charities and, and, and the archdiocese and, and, and religious organizations and anyone that wants to promote charity ought to be in favor of reducing the size and the scope and the expense of government as much as possible and increasing the, the, the understanding, the general idea in society that we should be doing things for ourselves, not relying on government in Washington or government of Beacon Hill to do it for us. Why don't those two go together in your, in your perspective? Well, I think that um, if, it were, if it were possible to overcome all that some people have to overcome to get to a level playing field, if our kids had equal access to good quality education, because education is such an important part of success in this country, certainly. If, and, and so if we had equal access for everyone to quality education, so kids could be more, inde be more independent, be more responsible once they got their education to earn a good living. If, it, if everything was level, then I would see less of a need, certainly, for a role for government or charities. Um, I would go back to charity's not all about money. Um, it's cer certainly money is required to accomplish some things, um, but when you talk about relation, I mean, when you get at its base, it's its relationship. It's how we treat each other. It's how we care for each other. It's how we watch out for the other guy. It's more than just money. Is that a statement about political policy or is that a statement about personal behavior? I, I think it can be interpreted. When a politician talks about compassion and what he means when he says compassion is taxes should be raised so that the government can have a Well, I don't think that that's always true. No, no, but I'm saying in, in a case where a politician uses the word compassion in that sense, do you hear that and think, yes, he's right? That is a kind of compassion? Or do you hear that and think, hey, buddy, compassion is when you reach into your own pocket and you take something out because you feel a personal connection uh, to a person who has need? When I, when I hear compassion from a government perspective, um, and, and what I think tax dollars should be used for. When you think about people who suffer from men certain kinds of mental illness, um, who have certain kinds of disabilities, for whom the playing field might never be level, then I think some combination of charity and government is required to try and help care for those And who people. decides what that combination should be? Well, don't we all, when we vote? But yeah, I, we all do. That's how po policy right. is made. But I'm asking right. in your in your in your uh, hierarchy of values and the way that you would, if you could, you know, frame the wave the magic wand. How do you decide which which needy person should turn to the government for help and which needy person should knock on Catholic Charities' door or 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 combine well, Jewish I, philanthropy? You know, I think that we have been deciding that over time, and it changes over time. And I think it's a you know what government is responsible for and what. Uh, private charity is responsible for uh, swings on a pendulum. Um, I do think that there was a time when it was all charity. Um, and I, I think we've gotten to a place where it's some governmental responsibility and some charity responsibility. I gotta tell you, one of the things that worries me most about uh, some of the uh, proposed cuts in domestic spending that are in the sequestering are what's gonna happen when uh, the government stops paying for some of the programs and services uh, that it pays for currently, because I don't think that um, private charities or public charities have the capacity to pick up the slack. And so people are going to, people who d wouldn't necessarily be hurting are going to be hurting. So, you know, when you look at the, when you look at government, we ask government to keep us safe in a lot of different ways. I mean, that's their job, keep us safe. And I think we all have a role in choosing how that dollar gets spent. Sir. All right, first of all, uh, before I get to the question, it should be noted for the record that Ann Rand uh, accepted both Social Security and Medicare right to the end of her life in 1982. So she apparently had no objection to that herself. But Ann Rand was also an anti-Arab bigot. When she appeared at Ford Hall Forum in 1974, she referred to Arabs as quote unquote primitive and savages, a tradition that's been carried on by the Ann Rand Institute. So doesn't this new gospel of yours of uh, selfishness lead to the kind of virulent bigotry 
that was exemplified by Ayn Rand and her acolytes? Only softballs at the Fort Hall Fort. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Because, I guess I was because saying a people, saying a people who send their little kids strapped with bombs into cafes and turning them into martyrs to kill yes. civilians, and no, you've asked your question, to kill civilians is barbaric, it is primitive. That is an objective statement of fact. That is not bigotry. Is, is it so occupation? Culture, is it an occupation culture, freedom? Any culture that does that. Is F-15s and uh, Apache attack any culture a better way to carry out terrorism? All right, you ask the question. He'll give the answer, and then let's bring it give back to charity. Uh, I'd be happy to return to the forum to do an Israel-Palestinian debate uh, anytime. Uh, I, I think I'll take the Israeli side. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what the what this has to do with uh, with charity, but it has to do with you know identifying uh, objective truth about a people, and it's sad that they're that way, but that's the way they are. And identifying it, it helps solve the problem. Is there a is it merely a coincidence that levels of charitable giving have traditionally been so high in the United States as compared with other countries, uh, and that the United States is the most or one of the most productive and freest uh, no. societies in history? Is, there, is, there, is it just a coincidence that those two? No, I, I think there's together? definitely a correlation between freedom and being charitable. It, you know, I think that free people are more benevolent people. Uh, I think people who are, who, are, who are not doing it out of a sense of guilt, who are not doing it out of a sense of moral duty and moral obligation are going to be more charitable. But I also think, um, you know, so so I think that is the that is the core reason why in the past and, and just to your question before, I guess I we were speaking over each other. I don't get it because it isn't like almost all charity come from very wealthy people. So if no. you create not at all, no, not at all. Okay, then not wrong. at all. That's how I conceive it. I you see. So that to me suggests that it's that there's something else driving. It. To me, I conceive of it as after I take care of all the things that are really, really, really important to me. And I have some stuff left over. That's, in terms of money at least, that's where I would be willing to be charitable. You know, at, at uh, Catholic Charities, we are blessed to have about uh, 2,600 volunteers help us over the course of a year. Some for an hour long project on a Saturday morning, some who come and mentor teenagers over time, 170,000 hours of volunteer time, and I would consider that um, certainly charitable good work. Um, and, and it doesn't require money. So I'm biased because it's uh, the Ayn Rand Institute. I mean, it does use volunteers, and we use quite a bit of volunteers, but I'd say 86% of the, 80 to 90% of the amount of money we get comes from relatively wealthy individuals. We don't get large numbers, we get large amounts. I, I think that there's very little question. If you check, check the data, you know, giving USA and the group yeah. that gathered, all, although large amounts of money come from, uh, from foundations and from wealthy individuals, the, 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 the great bulk of the money that's given comes, you know, as, <laughs> as is often the case with, uh, you know, with, with taxes. These small donations from lots of people add up to... Uh, to Think of the American Red Cross and their $10 cell phone contribution. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get another question. Uh, in uh, 1964, uh, President Johnson uh, introduced legislation, started the war on poverty. Since that time, uh, tens and tens of trillions of dollars, uh, not only through the government, but also privately. And as to what you were just speaking of, I'm sure millions of man hours have also been donated towards the cause of poverty. Yet, relatively, the percentage of uh, individuals in poverty in this country, speaking solely in America, uh, remains the same. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the fact, is there not enough being given by the people that freely donate or donate through their tax dollars? Or is it more to the fact of where yarn comes from that maybe we're not taking the shackles off of our society enough to allow more people to prosper? Um, I think that we're really just, um, it, it, it is tragic that as many people are living in poverty today as were when the war on poverty got started in the 60s. Um, I think it's a new, not relative new number based on the recession of 2008 that more people who had been enjoying a middle class lifestyle have slipped into poverty. So I think, you know, what we're looking at today is not the way it's trended. 
Um, it's a result, certainly, of this uh, great recession that we're just coming out of, hopefully. Um, I do think that one of the things that we don't understand is intergenerational poverty. And we're getting there. I think we're starting to develop better understanding, just like all of the thing, all of human behavior. We're getting better and better all the time at understanding how people, how and why people behave. You know, we're getting more sophisticated about the neuroscience of it. Um, we're starting to understand um, better intergenerational poverty and the things that can help impact that. We know that, um, you know, our, our goal is, you know, the gospel says the poor will always be with you. Our goal is that not the same people will always be poor. Um, we're, we're a nation of immigrants. We welcome people from all over the world. The people that come here start at, start at ground zero. We're always, there's always gonna be a level of poverty that we have to deal with as people move here to build, build wonderful lives for themselves. But um, I'm, I'm not sure I exactly shouldn't, answered your question. Shouldn't there be a concern though to, to, to play off that question? If sure. the government, if the war on poverty begins, didn't, might have begun with that title in 1964, but obviously government spending on welfare programs goes back earlier. But if it began in 1964 and the, the government spending increases and increases and yet the level of poverty uh, rises, the number of people living below the poverty level see, uh, increases, uh, doesn't, isn't there at least reason to suggest, to speculate, to wonder whether it might be counterproductive to think that the, the good works that can help lift up people who need help uh, is undermined when it's directed by a, you know, a, 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 an impersonal government that's taking the money mandatorily, setting rules that are supposed to be applied from top down. You say that charity is all about relationships. What relationship does anybody really have with a, a bureaucrat at the Department of Health and Human Services? Might it not be the case that there would be less need for charity, less poverty, less suffering, uh, if we were keeping it all here at home within a community, dealt with through voluntary action and not through government well, confiscation? If there are believers as Yaron are, not all that money would come into charitable good work if it were in the community. So I think that, um, that no, your premise isn't always true. And I think that, um, you know, while we all can point to a particular government program that we may or may not like, um, by and large, there's some combination of the public sector and, the, and civil society need to work together to solve problems. So I would argue that, no, first of all, we should, I don't see the necessity for having a, a significant level of poverty ever in society if it's free. Um, I think what we have, the poverty we have today, is a consequence of the government programs. And it's, a, it's worse than, than just the impersonal relationship that you're describing. Government programs, in a sense, institutionalize people into poverty. They create a poverty-like mentality. Uh, they create an entitlement mentality that is anti the kind of character that a human being needs to have in order to rise up and be successful and escape from, you know, from where they were born or from, from the set of circumstances that they had. It, what, what this country needs, or what every country needs, it, if, if you want to reduce poverty, what India needs, what I would advocate for those poor kids in India, who to some extent I care about, what I would advocate is more Ayn Rand. I would advocate freedom. I would advocate capitalism. Capitalism will do more to help the poor in India than any social program, voluntary or, or mother, a hundred Mother Teresa's, a million Mother Teresa's. If you just, and you're seeing it in India right now, more people have risen out of poverty because of capitalism than any program ever instituted. I mean, the whole concept of poverty didn't exist before capitalism because everybody was poor. I mean, if you project 250 years ago, there were some aristocrats over here and everybody else was poor. Today, the very fact that some people are middle class is an achievement of freedom and capitalism. Government programs you know, make this dramatically worse. And if they went away, the need for those programs would disappear and the need for so much charity would disappear. Sir. Uh, three quick questions, hopefully quick questions. Um, one for Mr. Brook, one for Ms. Rambo, and one a show of hands for the audience. Um, the one for Mr. Brook is the astounding statement that he made about 100 years ago, America was a freer place. And I was thinking of people who couldn't vote because of the color of their skin or couldn't travel or eat in a restaurant. 
or marry the person that they chose. I was thinking of women who wanted to have terminate a pregnancy but couldn't do so, or even have birth control. I was thinking of people who couldn't get into a college. Your own family would have been either kept out of a college. You, because of your family's belief in a uh, Bronze Age tradition, would have been kept out of a college or significantly shortened in the number of people that could go in. For Ms. Rambo, at one time, Catholic Charities was a separate 501c3. It wasn't under the control of the church. It was truly charitable. Um, it was before the Clinton, Bush, Obama faith-based funding program where money started going into faith-based organizations. There was no discrimination. You guys did a great job. Are you getting money now? from the government, and the last question for the audience, just sort of curious, how many people in here identify as objectivists or libertarians or something like that by hand? It's a good audience for you. <laughs> um, Thank you. Sure, Catholic Charities is a separately incorporated 501c3, um, though it is the social service, social justice ag agency of the church and the cardinal sits on our board of trustees. Um, we also do get a combination of private donations uh, and state, federal, and local do tax dollars to do our work. Um, you wouldn't so call all those dollars charitable, would you? I would the say ones that you get from the government, would no, you qualify those as charity? No, those are earned. We would call those earned dollars. Um, um, the, the church in Boston at this point in time does not give us um, cash. Uh, we have some in-kind uh, donations from the church in Boston, but I've got to say, our donor base, our private donor base is largely a Catholic population. We also, we serve more than 60% of our clients are not Catholic. Our staff is a multicultural staff, um, you know, except for the name on the door and some of the ethos that I think we bring, we could look like lots of other social service agencies. Um, I do think that um, our belief that everybody needs to be treated with respect and dignity makes us a little bit different, and we often go the extra mile to get work done. So it's a good question. Uh, how do you measure freedom, and, and by what parameters? Yes, 100 years ago, um, I can't remember if, if, if uh, women could vote 100 years ago or not. I can't remember the exact date. No, they couldn't. Yeah, so 1920, they started voting. Um, Blacks were certainly, there was institutionalized racism in, in many parts of this country uh, against blacks. There was uh, hidden anti-Semitism uh, or, or explicit anti-Semitism. It wasn't run by the state. It, so, uh, so I think people are free to be bigots. It's, it's, a, it's a sad state when they are, but they should be free to be so. Um, if I look at, a, at America 100 years ago, Everything was trending in the right direction. And the quality and quantity of the, the, the amount of coercive power the government exerted on society was relatively small. Granted, there were certain things that were horrible that you mentioned. But if you look at the amount of coercion in society, the amount of force being used by government on me, it was very minimal. We were probably the freest society that had ever been on Earth. Uh, we were moving in the right direction. We were moving towards allowing women to vote. We were moving towards, it took a little longer, unfortunately, uh, getting rid of, of, of state-authorized uh, discrimination and state-authorized racism. Um, that was the trend in which we were moving, uh, and, it's, and we took a turn. We took a turn probably in the, in the teens, uh, so exactly 100 years ago, uh, in terms of all other freedoms, and they start disappearing I think rapidly over the last hundred years, but if you just look at, you know, just a measure of, of uh, you know, how much income, how much of your time, and I, I don't agree with this idea there's money and then there's time. Time is money. I mean, these are fungible things. I could work more and make more money, or I could, you know, uh, spend my time. It's all, there's very much, there's very much a fungibility there. 40% of my time today is spent funding the government, funding programs that I don't believe in. Um, 
that's that's a big chunk of my time. I, you know, so forty percent of me is is a slave to somebody else. That's that's a lot. That's a lot worse than it was back then. Um, I can't start a business without having to again spend huge amounts of time appeasing bureaucrats. Um, if I do have a business, uh, you know, a huge amount of time. I talk to CEOs all the time, and CEOs spend. It, particularly if you're in a heavily regulated industry, CEOs spend four to five days a week dealing with regulators and lawyers because of the society we live in today. We are incredibly unfree. We don't realize how unfree we are because we're kind of born into it, and it comes, it comes slowly in little dribs and drabs, so it's disguised. But we're incredibly unfree. Just think you know, of the amount of time. Let me, let me stop you there because I want to get sure. uh, one last question before turning the program over to our lovely and talented executive director to close out for us. Get the last question. And good evening, just one quick question. Um, me as a person, I believe in helping myself before helping others. Um, you, Ms. Deborah, as a president of you know, a Catholic charity, do you try to invite people to become charitable and what reasons do you give them? What are you, what, what are you driven by? What drives you to become a charitable person? What drives me personally to do this work? Yeah, and how would you encourage people to become charitable? Uh, what, what drives me personally to do this work is um, you know, not very far away from some of what Yaron talks about in terms of personal satisfaction, from problem, you know, the intellectual curiosity about problem solving, about um, trying to make things work better. Um, our, our purpose, our end purposes might not be exactly the same because I'm not so driven by the financial reward um, that that brings, but um, there is a satisfaction in seeing other people do well. So, uh, you know, that, that, that call to serve that came in the 60s uh, when I was growing up, um, certainly part of my ethos and part of what makes me me. Um, you know, we welcome people to, um, to be charitable and what and I can't define for you what you're going to find is a charitable work. You know, that has to be what, what works for you. That's not my job. Um, you're, you're, you are responsible, I think, for that. Um, I, I, before I finish, though, I just wanted to challenge Jerome's other comment about the 40% of his dollars. There's got to be some things um, that government does that you find are useful. And so please don't say all of your 40% goes to useless tasks. There are some things that government does that we all pay for that we all value, I think. Well, in my case, my tax rate is actually 45%, and it's a 5% of the this somewhat value and the 40%, which is wasted. <laughs> it's very little. I, I think government should do very little. And, and it, even that, because of the way the government is constituted today, it doesn't do very well. But let me just I make just one. I just handed you that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to make one quick comment to what you kind of to the, the way you introduced the topic because I hear this all the time. So people say you need to help yourself before you help others, which is absolutely true. But the reason you should help yourself is not so that you can help others. The reason you should help yourself is because you are the reason you're alive. You are the reason you value. You are the reason you should live. You should help yourself for helping yourself. And then if you want to help others, fine. Thank you. Your own Brooke, Deborah Rambo, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>